So, hello everybody also from my side. Um, and I really appreciate being here. It has already been a very interesting uh, workshop so far. Um, so thanks to Dave and everybody for inviting me. What I will be t so my name is Ingo Ludke Bohle. As you can probably tell from that, I'm from Germany, specifically Bosch Cup Research. And I will be presenting the MicroRAS project, which is partially supported by a European Union grant, so I'm supposed to list this here. Um, and of course, I'm not the only one on this project. So, oh, that's, that's me here. Uh, I'm a senior expert on software platforms, whatever that means, at Bosch Corporate Research. So we are the Bosch Corporate uh, like Advanced Engineering Research Department. And we are close to Stuttgart. And Michael Ross is this team here. So you see that's me. That's a couple of other Bosch guys. And that's a team. I will go into that later. I just want to make sure that um, to make clear that I'm not the only one doing the work that I will be presenting here. And in particular, the NAT export is done by some other partners who have asked me to stand in for them here. So of course, I also work with NATX, but the modifications to NATX have been done by other people, just to make that clear. And those other people are also the ones doing the merge requests. Right, so what is it about? It's about robots. I just took a few random robots from the partners so this a typical manipulator by Acatronic, one of the partners, is a robot that is used in defusing bombs. Uh, well, that's a lawnmower for us. And so ROS stands for the Robot Operating System. And whenever we tell that to people, they ask an operating system like Linux or Windows, and no, that's not what the kind of operating system what this means. But if you look at operating system in a more general way, if you think about providing abstractions for the domain, then you could actually call this an operating system uh, for robotics because it provides abstractions for robotics domains. So what does this mean? Well, one of the motivations was to be a Linux for robotics. So the open source framework that everybody can use and that enables interoperability that's open source and everybody can contribute to. Uh, there is plumbing, what we call it, like process management, communication, some device drivers, data models. There is also support for multiple implementation languages. Um, and then there's tools. Uh, that, those are really like what most people get into, in touch with at first. Uh, Ross has pretty cool visualization tools for 3D data, for all kinds of other sensor data. There's simulation tools which can simulate physical environments. To, uh, re data recording, monitoring, all that stuff. And then capabilities are basically the fundamental building blocks for robotics. So you can, if you download ROS, you can basically get um, a full-blown navigation stack for mobile robots out of the box. You can get a path planning system for a robotic manipulator out of the box. All that stuff is already in there. It, you know, the, the predefined building blocks may not be the most advanced out there, but they get, you get the job done, basically. And then when you want to do research in one of those areas, then you can replace it. And what's arguably the most interesting part of ROS is this ROS is really an ecosystem. There is many, many people working on ROS, both academics and companies. Uh, we can all share our development there. And there's robot, like mo uh, hundreds of robots that are supported out of the box by ROS. There's efforts on documentation, on exchange. There's a marketplace, all that stuff. So it's really been a unifying framework for robotics. That's why many people are interested in ROS. So what, what does this mean on the lower side? So I'm going to start with giving you some basic background on ROS. This is all very high level, of course. Um, so in ROS1, the basic uh, entity is a node. So we, dis we separate our systems in nodes. And these nodes exchange messages. Typically, this has been done over TCP or UDP. It is possible to do this in process, but you know, typically that's done. And so what we do is we build systems out of, like for example, laser processing driver node, a SLAM node, which is um, stands for simultaneous localization and mapping. So local, like that the robot knows where it is. We can visualize stuff and so on. And these are exchange of the so-called topics. So a node and a topic. Those are the two main building blocks across. These can be distributed across machines. Uh, that's in terms of middleware, that's fairly standard. It's published subscribed middleware. We also have request response middleware. 
And because in robotics you often do things which take a while, there's uh, advanced request response uh, thing called an action, which is multi states. You can start it and then you can also abort it if it's taking too long or not succeeding. You get even intermediate feedback and so on. And internally, uh, nodes are callables. Basically, you register callables either to timers or to messages coming in. And they can be uh, implemented in various languages. C++ is one of the most popular ones because they are in the Python based language. And what's, what I would um, already mention this year, ROS uses a run to completion uh, approach just by, by default. So ROS is really like about making the easy thing easy. And then when you get into more complex things, you can also do those, but like the entry should be easy. One thing is now we have ROS2. Um, it's not the default yet because it's not quite as mature as ROS1. But one of the <coughs> big important things is that in ROS, well, I didn't explain this. There's actually in ROS1, there's this master system, sort of a name service. Every node uh, declares, contacts the master, declares that it's there, declares what topics it's interested in, and then the others also do that. In ROS2, we got rid of that, which um, was a long standing request and no single point of failure and so on, because in ROS2 we're using DDS as the data distribution services standard. So just, just to really give you a short idea. Um, this is um, a visual overview of some of the things in there. So for example, here this is a kinematic tree, and you see the various coordinate systems by these colored um, coordinate axes. Um, and here you see this is, for example, a path planning, uh, system with a visualization there, you can see the direction, and here you can see sensor data. This is all based on Argus. Argus has you know, a display with all sorts of sensor data. Here is RQT, is um, a core platform where you can plug in all sorts of visualization modules, and so on and so on. There's, there's really like a lot of stuff in there. Um, all started in 2007, not with these, but those are the first Bosch guys, sorry for that. <laughs> Um, and then 2008 there was this company called Little Garage and one of the interesting things there is for community building they did this internship program where they basically took in 30 PhD students from all over the world every year and they could use ROS, they could work on their robots and they could get used to that and they also contributed their functional components to ROS um, so that was really one of the key ingredients to making this success then 2010 ROS1 was released, 2013, Willow Garage folded and spread into multiple spin-off companies and they had created a foundation, this open source robotics foundation. And uh, for a long time they basically did the same job as OSRF. And then in 2015 ROS2 started, it was released in 2017 and we are now on the third release called Crystal, oh no, actually on the fourth release called Dashing. <coughs> And the interesting thing there is maybe also this foundation with the advent of ROS2, they really broadened and they have a much more encompassing structure now. There's a technical steering committee where companies can join if they contribute resources to the development and so on. So if you're interested in also maybe growing uh, the foundation, like the organizational structure of Notex, maybe this could be something that, that you look at. And can I can also tell you more about that later. So this is just to give you an idea, we are now in 2018, uh, for those are the basic ROS1 releases. Here is where you get Debian packages, and here is installation instructions. So we really, most of the stuff there is Debian, is Debian packaged, and you can also get RPMs or ARP Linux also as packaged. So it's fairly easy to install all this. Now, that was all standard ROS running on Linux, or nowadays also Windows and Mac OS. So why am I here? Why are we doing MicroRoss? We are doing one, and MicroRoss basically uh, was motivated, uh, or the motivation was captured in one of the sentences for the ROS2 design, which is that it should be uh, possible to implement ROS directly <coughs> on the embedded system. Well, nowadays, we typically talk to embedded systems using some kind of serial protocol. They're like out there behind the communications link, but not, what we really want is put ROS on there directly. This could be both a Linux-based embedded system, which is what many people are also doing already, or how we see it, how we would like to grow it, also a microcontroller-based systems system. And we want to do that basically because microcontrollers are everywhere. 
These are just two examples. So like this typical setup, we have like some sort of technical and general purpose computer often running Linux, and then we have a bunch of microcontrollers around it. And here I just marked on the undercoverage of the lawnmower where the various controllers are. So you see this, there is plenty of microcontrollers in there and we want to address those. So that's the typical structure. We have some kind of Linux-based system out there, a serial bus, a firmware, and the firmware is what we want to get into. And that's what MicroOS is about. So for that, we uh, thought it would be nice to have some additional funding, and we managed to convince the European Union to give us some. Um, there is basically the messages. We wrote this called Opera, Open Framework for Embedded Robot Applications. Uh, funded in the, uh, since one and a half years now. Here are some of the partners. So Acutronic is doing the low level uh, Arthur stuff. For integrating with Natex. Eprosima is doing middleware. We are mostly focusing on the, on the client library and using the other stuff, of course. So we are typically the people who notice when something down here breaks. And Fireware is a European um, association which tries to contact to the IoT domain. And then there's also a Polish research institute called PIA. They do benchmarking. Right. So, all right. Question there? From this, uh, the, sorry, the amplification has dropped. Well, the sorry. amplification has I don't dropped. Know everybody can understand. Okay, maybe mm -hmm. I should. This could be because it's off. I'll try and put, oh, it's low battery. I just put new ones. Yeah. Just put new ones. Yeah, I don't know. It says low battery. Okay. Maybe if I try speaking louder, we'll, we'll manage okay. that. We'll find some more batteries. Oh, we find some more batteries. <laughs> anyway, so that's just the product structure. Now, one of, okay, I said, um, we have a bunch of microcontrollers already in the product, so that's the motivation. But actually, there's other people who have a different perspective, and they say, hey, why don't we do everything on Linux? You know, we have single board computers uh, which are powerful enough today running Linux, like Raspberry Pis or so on. Hardware integration has become much easier. Why don't we do that, right? And there's, there's a lot to be said for that. Uh, so the Linux ecosystem is really attractive. There's excellent libraries for perception, planning, networking, everything like that. And they have a very unified developer ecosystem. I can install Linux on almost anything. It's quite different from the microcontroller world. And every, mo almost everybody has access to a Linux system on their desks, either directly or through a virtual machine or something. Okay, but of course, there are some reasons, otherwise I wouldn't be standing here. The reasons are twofold. One is peripheral access, but it's, it's still easier with microcontrollers. There is hard low latency, real time, which is, Linux isn't quite there yet and probably won't be for a while. Power saving, of course, as has been mentioned before, and eventually, not in MicroOS as such as in this project, but eventually you want to go in the direction of safety. And I usually have a much longer set of slides after this explaining all of this in detail, and, but I thought those are basically the things that are, you are already familiar with, so I skipped those. Okay, now I can give it another try here. But the one thing I want to mention because it's really important for us is safety. Okay, is this working? Yes. yes. All right, okay, excellent. So um, safety is really one of the things that has been tried in Linux for a while, for some years already, and we are not seeing it getting anywhere. Um, because Linux is just too big, and it's very, very difficult to safety certify something as big as Linux. So we think that it's a much more reasonable, much more pragmatic approach to certify something which is uh, as small as, uh, as Nantex, for example. And the second reason that I would just like to point out here is that at the moment when you buy a lot of sensors and actuators they have a microcontroller inside. This microcontroller has some firmware typically and typically the vendor doesn't let you change it. And you know, with all due respect to hardware vendors, they often don't know what we need really. So it would be often so much easier if we could just replace or add something to the firmware that's in there and we can't. So the second motivation that we have with MicroRoss is that it would be really cool if we could get into some sort of open source firmware activity for robotics. Maybe even more general, maybe that's what Nadex has been trying already. 
but for us it's on a higher level, something that I, as the typical cross robotics developer, could use. That's the second motivation that we have, and some of the work we do is motivated primarily by that. So, we chose NOTEX. That's the default. I always mention that because, in principle, we could have the idea that we might want to support something else, and a couple of the choices are here. Um, but in practice, it's going to be NOTEX for a while. And the reason for that is POSIX. Right. So we're coming from Linux. Linux has a POSIX API. NOTEX has a POSIX API, so that's great. It really makes our task much easier. And the secondary reason is it's also Linux like in many other respects, right? So we can get a C standard library. And we'll come to some limitations of that later on, but I mean, it's there already. If you look at some of the other R trusted state, it's not so easy. What I should say is there is some prior work in the ROS2 area, which has used other R trusses. Riot is one of them. So Riot is, is in the domain, it's a research R trust. Uh, they're doing content centric networking. And there is um, some research labs in France which have used that. We are also quite interested in Zephyr because of safety, and we'll talk about that later. And of course, everybody asks about free artists. I'm frankly hope, um, happy that we don't use free artists because it would make my task much harder. But it has a lot of user base, people are asking for it. Maybe at some point we'll have to address it. So, beyond that, we're also using, so basically, I mean, that's a big difference to. Uh, ROS on Linux, right? So we changed the operating system. The second thing we changed is that we changed the middleware. And particularly, we're using something that's called DDS XRCE for extremely resource constrained environment. So that is what we consider a microcontroller to be, um, both in terms of memory and in terms of power and so on. So the basic idea is I mean, DDS is the standard middleware that you use in ROS2. You could use others. People have done that, but that's a, stand, that's a default. And there's a couple of different vendors selling that. DDS uses a protocol called RTPS for real-time publish subscribe. You probably know, heard about that. And what this what this protocol does is it's very chatty. Um, it distributes discovery information on the network all the time. So if you want to know who else is out there and distributing data, you have to listen all the time. That's not good for bad report devices. And also, you're basically expected to maintain a table of what's out there in memory. Again, not so good if you have limited resources. But DDS has some other cool features, like it's really great at quality of service. So handling wireless links, easy. Handling low, high latency links, all easy. Handling disconnected systems with fallback if something breaks, all, all, all in there already. So it's, we like it. But it's not very good for micro. So DD and the OMG, which is the standards body that does DDS, they recognized this quite a while ago, and they came up with this DDS RxRC standard, which is, has many of the same concepts, but uses a client-server approach. So we have these clients here, and then there's something called an agent. The agent is expected to be running on something bigger, which is on all the time, and the, but these connections here, they can be established easily. And so the, the client could, could go to sleep and then come back and say, hey, I'm back, you know, all my configuration already, yes, done, go there. Could even deliver some stored information and so on. So that's the other big differences of micro ROS. Uh, I summarized this here a little bit. So ROS2, basically, you know, x86, ARM projects, A-class things, big, big RAM, big disks, high bandwidth, Linux, Windows, Mac OS, and so on. This is micro ROS. And I also mentioned something here, Sample will also use the XRC implementation directly. Autarium is one of them, I believe. And uh, so that's, we think, mainly interesting for uh, even smaller devices. But you should say right now, the other stuff here in the middle is a bit immature. So many people are also using this directly because the rest doesn't work so well. But we're getting there. And I would like to add for those people who do that, that we are currently porting our execution layer, which is custom for microcontrollers, also to this part, so that you will be able to use the ROS execution layer with XOC directly. So what is that in more detail? As I said, we want to do composable firmware. Um, the reason vendors don't like that is, you know, um, there are two ways, just that knows people don't like that because of interference. You know, if I add something, it could break what's already there. And the microOS approach towards this is that we have this so-called system modes, which allow us to change 
and we have the main specific scheduling, which is expected to provide some guarantees about interference. Uh, system modes, um, are, they're also about formal, like the, what, what the system modes give us. System modes basically allow me to formally specify the states in my system beyond just what's in the component. So I have an explicit description of the states in my component, and I have an explicit composition of those states to a full system, and I can do all sorts of checks on that. I mean, yeah, I'm really like high level here. Please ask me if you're interested in more. And then what we did, we implemented this. There's a so-called mode manager, which does that. The subsystem has these modes. I have a longer description here. Basically, what we do is we can tolerate. Um, this is for like power saving. Is one of the things there. We can tolerate degradation. Like if a sensor fails, we have a, we can model this using system modes and so on and so on. So it's really like a very explicit description. And the idea is, if we make the what's happening there more explicit, it will allow us to check the overall system in a bit better way so that we could add stuff and still be sure it all works, generally. Predictable execution. Um, so in ROS, that's actually a fairly complex subject that I can only touch upon uh, very quickly. That's the main part of what we're doing at Bosch, actually, is the system modes on the one hand and the execution on the other stuff. So ROS1, as I mentioned, at this thing, everything FIFO. Like first in, first out. You message timer comes in, message comes in, it's all put into your queue and then processed one by one. Um, and if you have multiple processes running, well basically it's a linear scheduler that decides what happens, which some people don't like because they don't know what's going on. Um, in ROS2, what they did is they made this execution uh, separate. So there's a thing called executors, um, and you can have multiple of those for specific things. It's shouldn't happen. Okay, and um, so what? For example, what we can do is we can have multiple of those, and we could put could put the executors at different priorities. So, for example, we could handle the emergency stop message in, at a higher priority than you know something like diagnostics. Um, so that that's the real time executor, and it has to be said that right now ROS two does not have a real time capable executor, even though they're trying to be real-time, they don't have that. So this work is applicable to ROS2 as a whole, it's not just for micro ROS. And we also want to look at domain-specific scheduling. Often um, we have priorities, priorities are not composable, and prior and roboticists don't understand priorities in general. I mean, other, unless they are also real-time experts, but many aren't. So what we have is um, domain-specific schedulers. One thing is, you know, sense plan act. That's, that's a very simplified approach, but you know, and there's a very old theory in robotics which basically said that you can decompose the processing in your robot into basically sensing your environment, building an environment model, planning on that model, and then acting on it. Didn't work, but um, it's because it's not that simple. But I mean, this, the general idea that you have stages and that the stages have to be some sort of complete before it makes sense to invoke the next stage, that holds fairly well. Uh, typically, you want to collect all the sensor data first and then process them as a whole and stuff like that. So, and sense plan act is also like if I can slot something into these stages, I have better uh, composability because I see maybe I have a budget for sensing, I can put something in there, and then if sensing's budget is overrun, that's you know, it's just it does only interferes with the other sensing stuff and not with the planning and acting stuff. So, but that, that feeds into budget based scheduling. We are big fans of reservation-based scheduling. It's not, yeah, um, all in it. Anyway, and so that's that's one of the things we can do there. Just to give you an example of, of what that could be is, for example, you could have your drivers in the sense plan, sense part. You could have a model building, like sense diffusion and mapping here, pl some planning there, some acting here. That's that's the general idea, and then we, you know, we, uh, but um, well, oh, sorry, I, I missed that. Um, that these are typically distributed in a different way than nodes. So nodes typically contain callbacks which are across the spectrum of stages. So in the, in the old way, what would happen is that the node would execute it sequentially, which would mean it would go from sensing, modeling, planning, acting all in one go, in parallel to the, all the other sensing, planning, and acting things going on. And so we changed that here. And uh, we said, okay, we're gonna take those and distribute them accordingly based on this information. So, 
that's just a very re really really quick overview of some of the work we're doing in MicroRoss and why we're doing it. And now, since I'm here at the Natex workshop, I would like to give you some feedback on what our experiences with Natex, good and bad, and maybe you know give some idea on, on what what we would like to see or not. So, and first of all, I would just to give you some perspective of where this is coming from, my personal Natex journey. I had no experience with Natex or any other real-time operating system before this project. So I'm, I'm in this one and a half years now. Before one and a half years ago, I have never touched an embedded and like a microcontroller. I will attach one in, in terms of like there was one in the robot, but I never worked with it. So just just to give, I'm an, I'm a Linux guy. I've been using Linux for 20 years. That's what I know. Um, one of the other partners chose Nadex because they have experience there. And at first I didn't care. And then, then I became annoyed. <laughs> I, have to say. I really have to say that was my first experience with Nadex because I had to configure it for my board and I was like, mm -hmm. I mean seriously, I've configured Linux kernels before, right? 20 years ago, <coughs> we all had to do that. And I sort of thought I knew how this is done, but Nadex really puts it on a different level. And this <laughs> continued with, with some other aspects. And I really, I, that was the point where we had a big discussion in the party and I said, guys, you know, are you really expecting the typical roboticist to be able to use this? And so we discussed this a lot. And basically the, the answer we gave was no. We are not going to be bring this, we're gonna be able to bring this to a point where the average roboticist is going to be able to use it. And our only recourse is we have to avoid that the typical roboticist has to use this. So we are going to start talking, or we already did, started talking to companies which build basically small embedded computers for roboticists. We, because we are expecting that those guys know what they're actually like doing in terms of hardware and so on, and they could package this for, for the rest of us. And then we also start looking at alternatives. <laughs> <laughs> they were in the need, yeah. So. And I got more experience, as I said, one and a half years, right? Starts to like some stuff. So one, a personal thing was really like I wanted to have time synchronization and I just went in there and turned off NTP and it worked and it was like, yeah. Or I have wanted to have network configuration, I just went in there and enabled DHCP and it just worked. I mean, that was awesome, really. I, I mean, of course, from Linux, that's, that's, I'm used to that, right? But it was really cool to have this on the, on the microcontroller as well. So, and now I'm actually at the point now where I start recommending it um, for, for certain applications, right? For certain applications. And, but I'm still, you know, still at this point not certain we can actually build a product out of this. And now I'm going to give you a little bit more feedback on, on all of these things. So we chose it because of the peak sport report and because of the developer ecosystem, right? That's a bit more in depth what I said before. C, C, CSP, IP, Pro 6. We used these STM32 boards. Feels like Linux. That was basically it. But the configuration is like that, you know? You never know where you have to look. And if, I, if somebody hadn't shown me the slash command, I would probably still have lost it until today. Because if you want to change something and you actually even know, what the configuration is called, but you just don't find it. And you don't find it because you have to turn something on somewhere else, and then you can turn it off, you turn it on something other than big than bear. And this whole, there is talk about lower half and upper half, and I just don't understand it. And I know I got some idea what it means, but then I didn't. And then I got it configured in Feds compiled. And it's like, and back. And this is like really, really, this, was, that was hell. And I already gathered from some other comments that you're aware of this issue. And, um, and there is some solution. I mean, it's a hard problem, actually. I know. I, I talked to some of the other microcontroller guys at Bosch, and I said, yeah, well, it's, it's bad. Anyway, then hardware support. Hardware support is the other part. So really, what our, you know this, right? Indiana Jones, Laredes of the Lost Ark, he wants, he, there's a gold statue here, he wants to go there, and it looks like <laughs> the, the park is OK. And this is like with Natex, you know? You want to have a board, and there's something in the board support for Natex, hopefully, and so it looks good. But then this happens. You, you might investigate this, and you probably know if you've seen the film that some of these things actually break. And, 
Indiana Jones almost falls. <laughs> and so basically the thing there is this reduces trust, right? You, you expect something there and you see something there and then it doesn't work. This is actually this is worse than if there wouldn't have been anything. And this is, but as I said, the others are even worse. This is, I, I see this everywhere. Like I look at Zephyr, I look at Embed, I look at any of the ones, any of the open source real-time operating systems. It's like they say they support the board and I say, oh yeah, by the way, from 20 peripherals we support three. I mean, seriously, that's not support. Um, or at least that's not what I expected. Um, and one of the things, oh, that's, that's broken, sorry about that. One of the things is also when I look at how this, how the board support packages are being done, I'm really, really wondering if that's the right approach. And I know that many people do it like that, and as I said, I'm a Linux guy. But what I hear from my colleagues who are doing like uh, real um, artists for the engine control units and stuff, they always talk about model-driven code generation, where you have basically a model of your microcontroller, which all the registers and all that stuff, and they just generate this, then generate the board support package for you. And they have state machines for the behavior in, in the background, and they do all that. And it seems to be fairly code and tool intensive, but it seems to work uh, for them. So maybe something about that where you and if you and if you look at the model, you also know okay, these parts of the model are supported and the others aren't. And the third one that I want to just quickly get at, POSIX timers. So yes, I have clock get time. But on Linux, clock get time has a nanosecond resolution. On, on the microcontroller, it doesn't, because the hard real-time clock in the microcontroller does not have nanosecond resolution, at least not on our boards. And then I have, see, oh, there's prescalers. So it could be more accurate than it is, but then it would consume more power. Okay, well, how do you change that? Oh, I can't. Anyway, I, I could, of course, right? It's open source, uh, and that's cool. Um, but then I see, okay, but then there's a dedicated timer API, and that exposes all of the features that I really want. And that, all those timers are actually hardware timers, and they are more accurate. So what this means is that at the time, I do have the features and the functionality that I want, and I understand why you can't expose them using POSIX, because POSIX just doesn't give you all the features that the microcontroller has. But that sort of destroys the appeal of having a POSIX API, because for the real good stuff, I still need to go to the to, uh, to the dedicated stuff, and then when I have to explain to somebody why I'm choosing Natex instead of like Zephyr, for example, and I say, yeah, it's a POSIX API, uh, that's one of the, one, not the only, but one of the minor advantages, but then the POSIX API is not actually usable for some of the relevant use cases, I get a bit of an argumentation problem. Just to, I mean, it's not serious, bad or something, but I'm, I'm pointing this out just to give you some feedback. And the other stuff is, you know, actually, when I first came to microcontrollers, and I thought, oh, there's this peripheral, and I can just read the register. That's cool. I like that. And then, okay, I notice, oh, it's not text, but in the not text, I have to open a dev file, and I have to use IO controls, and, you know, um, that's, your, I know why you did this, and it has advantages and disadvantages, and I think it's, it's also, but it's, it's a decision that has been made in post I don't know what, 30 years ago, and, I've seen some bare metal C++ template libraries which also make this pretty cool, the register access and it's safe and so on. I'm just pointing this out, maybe it's something you could look at. And the last part is safety. Safety is the main thing why I'm worried whether I can use Nutex in the product. Not because Nutex, I'm not, I, I'm not saying Nutex isn't safe, I'm not saying Nutex isn't certified. Um, and it's, I'm wondering whether it's certifiable. And then I see there's Zephyr. And Zephyr is putting a lot of effort into this. And I know probably you and many other people have asked how in the, well, how on earth did Zephyr manage to be a Linux Foundation project? Well, but they did, right? And now they're a Linux Foundation project, and they've got lots of resources, and they're addressing safety. And addressing safety in a good way. First they addressed security. That was a good start got them here on the basic quality management and all that stuff, on reviewing and all that stuff. And now they're progressing towards safety. And they're the only open source real-time operating system that's about safety. And safety is one of the main reasons we are still using proprietary real-time <coughs> operating systems. Not because they have more features also, and they have better tools. But those, those are not so important. Safety is really a killer. And that's something that, yeah, that's, that's a big thing. And then the last part is on foundations. Well, that's another X homepage, you know that, and that's the Zephyr homepage. That looks nicer. 
I mean, maybe the information there isn't even better or something like that. But just saying, uh, if I show this to my management, they are not liking it. And if I show that, I'll say, oh, that's professional, right? That's, even though it's open source, it's professional, right? They like that. I can sell this. Anyway, so just as the very last thing here, how do I start this? This is the small demo that we did. And it's just really like a small robot, and there's an OLM export down here, and it's connected to the robot, and it just drives around. Um, so that was my proof of concept that mm -hmm. that's all done on the on Notex with the with the hardware control and all that shit. Um, anyway, that's not one of our robots. It's just it's a research robot that many people are flying around, and the. We use RCL directly, that's the level that we're currently at. We can't use RCL CPP. Um, we can use C, we can't use RCL CPP for some unrelated reason. And it's, that's just, it's just driving around there. And I was surprised. All right, that's it for me. Thank you all a lot for your attention. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate. Right. We will try and keep the questions down if you don't mind, guys. But just a couple of questions, if there are. Or we can move straight along and we can do questions in the break. I guess I have one question. Did you reach out to the community when you're having issues with configuration? No, we did. Typically, uh, when I have issues with configuration, I need it done fast. So I just bang at it until I've got it solved. And I usually succeeded in, in doing so before I felt the need that I really have to throw up my hands and go to the community. And, uh, and from, from my point of view, having suffered this myself, it's quite difficult to know how to frame your question. So you've got something that just doesn't work. I mean, uh, Alan had this last week on the LCD for STM32. The, the, it was a configuration issue. We've got no way of telling it was a configuration issue. It just didn't work. And it's very difficult to know how to frame the question as a configuration question because it's so deeply embedded in amongst everything else. One more? Well, just one point to this. So that I know that the Buildfruit team, they are building random configurations and they make sure that they compile, and if they don't compile, they go into the kconfig stuff and make sure that all the depends on and selects are correct. So, so they are running overnight builds with random configurations and make sure that they compile. Oh, this, that's clever. This helps to, to get it uh, stable. That's a, that's a good idea. How do you go with reloading things that compile and actually has all the stuff you want in it? No, it's, it's, <laughs> of course they don't. It's just, it's just a build uh, machine which all yeah. of it today is rendered. But, but, but it's a start. It, it at least removes some of the state space. Yeah, you could do that. Okay, thank you. Very, very interesting.